Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod episode 72. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, the salute out to you. I look at my left hand, so it looks like the right what hand. What do you say, Johnny? <laughs> How you doing, bro? I'm home for two weeks here in Palo Alto. So it's uh, been great. Um, kicking off the pod here into the week. A lot, lot going on this week. First of all, I had the um, long, short week with the with the Labor Day weekend. Um, there was a big meme going around from last Sunday from Paul Graham, founder mode. That got up the rounds. That, that really was awesome. I, I thought that was phenomenal. Love to go into detail with you on that. Um, um, boatloads of capital coming in. Big news around the AI companies. Uh, OpenAI got got billions of dollars for his company. The antitrust thing. I want to do a big segment with you on this. Is that uh, you know, NVIDIA's antitrust scrutiny? Uh, is is this a pause on the AI hype cycle? We'll debate that. And then, you know, there's a lot of discussion going around around funding levels. Um, you know, it, it build it, they will come. Remember the field of dreams. That's yep. a segment I want to do with you on around AI. Is the idea of king making the the, the build that they will come funding strategy where investors put big money into one company called king making, as they say in Silicon Valley, is that going to be the strategy? It's been a deterrent for people, but will it work? That's a big discussion because you're seeing the democratization you know, we see that going on. Of course, custom silicon is going to be another area I want to drill down with you on because, you know, um, custom silicon is like the new drug, Dave. Everyone's taking it. You know, so custom silicon, they want to have their own chips. Apple did it. Um, everyone's doing it. So Apple, to... Tesla, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. It's a lot less expensive to build your own chips today, probably 50% less expensive than it was even just five years ago. And it's you like, can do it twice as fast. What's the old expression? It's like teenage sex. Everyone says they're doing it, but no one's really doing it. No, I think people are doing it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Well, doing it right. <laughs> That's not, that might be a whole other discussion. Um, you know, you know, obviously that whole NVIDIA DOJ case and FTC is getting involved. The New York Times even wrote a piece about it. I saw that this week. Uh, big deal. And again, the, the GPU um, farms are getting bigger. Elon Musk launches his AI training system with 100,000 NVIDIA uh, chips. Um, and then OpenAI is hitting a million paying business users in the enterprise. That's that's pretty whopping number. Um, and then, you know, just over, overall, just tons of stories. You got big, big events coming up. We're going to be back on the road. And uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, Dave, this is, this is the big discussion right now. AI, will it, will it, will it work? And, and then are we going to hit a recession? Uh, this is going to be interesting to see if if a recession happens. I don't think I still think there's a huge demand for GPUs, and I think the demand for supercomputing that's being democratized is continuing to boom. HPE, Dell, both sh showing great results on servers, server sales. When was the last time you heard that? So I think the server sales is is one of the areas that's going to be really rocking. Um, and just you know, just Gelsinger, more bad news about cutting the divisions there. You see that. Intel reporting weighing options on their networking units, selling off business units. Well, Mobileye, which was uh, was never, I mean, I was never a huge fan of that acquisition. <clears throat> and then they had a, they only own eighty percent of it now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you on Intel. It's not like we haven't been sit, saying this over and over and over and over and over again. And it, like I've said many times, it gives me no pleasure to to say that we've been correct in predicting the challenges that they're going to have but and i still still see analysts on twitter like hey you're doing great I'm like no yeah, not pays, doing great. pays a lot for those analysts to, to cheerlead for them um you know we're the biggest cheerleader for intel but we're not going to actually lie about it like other people well intel is a client of ours it's not like they're not you know we've, we've done business with intel for years but it's just i mean the the math just is not in their favor well, let me ask you about NVIDIA's antitrust um, thing. Bloomberg ran a story, um, and other people picked up on it. The Justice Department is investigating the behavior of NVIDIA, that they're violating antitrust laws, and the FTC will play a lead role in examining the conduct of OpenAI. Um, Microsoft is involved because of OpenAI, kind of by results. So they're starting to send out subpoenas. I mean, is will it matter, Dave, um, or will demand keep the gen... AI hardware flywheel going. Well, Will the NVIDIA scrutiny put a pause in the hype cycle? Well, first of all, it's very unclear what this is about because, you know, supposedly the story came out saying NVIDIA 
was subpoenaed, and Nvidia said, "No, no, we weren't. <laughs> we we reached out to the DOJ. We're like, what is all this?" And so, you know, to me, I mean, Nvidia's monopoly. If, if by the way, I think Nvidia does have a monopoly on you know high end GPUs. I, we've said that uh, because they have no competition. So I guess by definition, that's a monopoly. But they kind of stumbled into it because you know, 15 years ago they started developing CUDA and they they bet doubled down on big GPUs and they bought uh, uh, Mellanox to get InfiniBand and they use that as their sort of proprietary networking, you know, interface or not interface but but connectivity, um, and and then all of a sudden the you know ChatGPT comes out and looks like Nvidia was geniuses and everybody starts buying GPUs so. So it's not like much different than the time it took, for instance, for Microsoft and Intel to earn their monopoly. And so it's like they, they I don't want to say stumbled into it because it wasn't really by accident, but all of a sudden the market shifted and they had this huge tailwind. And so I don't understand how NVIDIA is using its quote unquote monopoly power to thwart competition. It doesn't have competition. The rest of the world is trying to catch up. I, I I don't see NVIDIA. I mean, maybe they're doing things like, like I read that they were uh, favoring customers who purchased larger proportions of their, you know, st their stack from NVIDIA. Well, that's just rewarding loyalty. I don't necessarily see that as, you know, breaking the Sh Sherman Antitrust Act, you know, uh, and so... I don't really understand what this is all about. The, to yeah. your question is, will it have an effect? I mean, it certainly has an effect on the stock price, but I, I've said, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times that market forces are much more effective than the government at regulating monopolies. Having said that, I do think if a company is breaking the law, that narrow uh, remedies are in order, but narrow remedies, not sweeping remedies like let's break up google i think that's asinine and just well, not the place of government to do that prosecutors are reporting that looking into nvidia's practices uh, mainly around locking customers and that's one through its chips through software restrictions the second thing is is um how nvidia distributes products under the un, under the microscope they're looking at are they giving preferential treatment to customers who buy full systems potentially shutting out competition um and so i think <laughs> Those, those are the areas where, I mean, there is muscle, I mean, but they have software. And the question about lock-in is, is key. To, and, and I think I'm not for this, obviously, but NVIDIA deserves the results that they get. What bothers me is, is that there's a knee-jerk reaction in the government to tax growth, right? What's the old expression? If it moves, the government will tax it, anything that moves. These, these antitrust investigations marks a significant turning point in the market because it shows that the hype's tampering down because they're trying to rein it in. They don't even know what it means. What does is, what is winning on merit mean? That's what NVIDIA is saying. It, but it, it's it's really the bigger question there. Is, who, are they assuming that NVIDIA is unchecked? I got to tell you, NVIDIA is not operating unchecked. They have long release cycles. They know what's coming. They have supply chain challenges. Um, but this is knee-jerk reaction from the government that, oh, you've grown too fast. Therefore, You've crossed the line. That's bullshit. So I, I just don't have a, I, I have a huge problem with the knee jerk reaction. Now I do see, you know, a similarity between Microsoft in the old days, remember operating system software and, and office, office suite. NVIDIA looks like they could have power if their systems are good. And do they use that power? So I can get the logic around um, how they could lock customers out because let's face it, Microsoft did that with the browser. If you didn't ship browser, their browser, you got different treatment. And that was proven. But I think in court. it's different. That was proven think, in court, by the way. But I think it's different. I, I agree with you, Microsoft, but it's much different. Here's why Microsoft had browser competition from Netscape. They had application software competition from Lotus and Harvard presentation graphics and WordPerfect. They had um, networking software competition from Netware. And what Microsoft did that one could argue was illegal is they used their monopoly power and their Windows dominance to then bundle in the browser and bundle yeah. in all those other capabilities and build that office suite. And that, you could argue, was, was uh, you know, breaking the, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act. So I see NVIDIA as 
substantially different because NVIDIA has no competition. <laughs> there's, there's nobody that can compete today with NVIDIA. You know, AMD, it, b- believe me, if I, my opinion, if AMD could ship, you know, the, AMD can sell every GPU that it can make, right? And so th- I don't understand this, this idea that they're thwarting competition. They're thwarting competition because they did the work 15 years ago and made a huge bet that cost them massive amounts of market capitalization. Their stock got killed, you know, when they were were going through this period of time. And there were some really challenging periods for holders, those holders of NVIDIA stock. And then it's now paying off and the government's stepping in going, whoa, they're having too much success. I just, it just, it just reeks of, of, of too much government to me. Well, first of all, I'm not saying, I'm saying for a fact that Microsoft killed Netscape specifically. Yes, no doubt. That's done. No that, doubt. Those, but that that actually happened. I don't see NVIDIA doing it here because I think the problem is, is that when they say uh, we want to make a competitive market, people people have struggled to compete with NVIDIA, not because NVIDIA's got muscle and are violating antitrust laws. They're struggling to compete because they don't have a product, right? So- that's yeah. the issue, right? The, the, and the problem I have with the uh, scrutiny on NVIDIA, because when you start getting these kind of scrutinies, they have to, they change their business practices, how it's, how comp, uh, products are, are built, monetized, and distributed. So I think you're forcing NVIDIA to do something that they don't want to do, and they don't they shouldn't have to do, because the people struggling to compete didn't invest in software like CUDA in the time that they did in start doing software. I think it's still early days, so I think there's plenty of time to catch up for the Dells and the HPs, Lenovo's, and everyone of the of the of the hardware guys to come up with AI PCs. We'll get into that later, but I think the issue is when when the government makes these moves, it becomes a mandate for a broader crackdown on the AI industry as a whole, and that's wrong. That's to your point. If Microsoft, who killed Netscape, and they did in a very bloody way, the first browser got killed, Mark Andreessen's company, but Netware and others are still out there. So the, the crackdown that the government's going to start saying is they're sending the signals to the innovators. Oh, we're going to look at all acquisitions. If you have if you even grow too fast, that's a proxy for um, a monopoly. It's just ridiculous. Monopolies um, are about competition and prices. Are prices going up or are the prices going down? And, you know, always that's always my issue with Amazon. Amazon makes my life better. I get stuff shipped faster. Amazon Web Search is better than a data center if you're building stuff. So they actually make things go faster and they're cheaper. What's wrong with that? Oh, so people couldn't keep up and they struggled to be competitive. That's on so, them. That's on them. NVIDIA I, has an advantage. They deserved it. And let the competition come in. A- ARM is working on graphics processors yeah, as fast I, as they can. I, I, I will say this. And, and of course, NVIDIA is, is you know, much of its architecture is built on ARM, but I would say AMD, Intel, AWS, Google, Microsoft, Huawei, Broadcom, Grok, all want a piece of the NVIDIA pie. Now, I would say that if if the DOGA said, okay, NVIDIA, you got to stop, you know, strong arming customers and, you know, you got to open up your interface, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you got to make your software open source. Let's say they took those radical uh, steps. Nothing would change. NVIDIA would still have the majority of the, the the GPU market. Now, maybe you could argue, okay, the government's getting ahead of it, and they're 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 preserving. They, they don't because they've screwed up so badly in the past, being so late, too little, too late. Um, but again, the problem I have with the DOJ and the FTC is, to me, you've got to be able to demonstrate that a company is using monopoly power and and breaking the law, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and I, I just don't see it. Certainly, I don't see it as blatantly as we did with Microsoft. Microsoft, you could see it. We all saw it at the time. We're like, wow, Microsoft bundling. You know, they're basically killing Netscape. And even Netscape, remember, Jim Barksdale was he had so full of hubris because their stock price was so high. He's like, yeah, it's no big deal to us. We're going to get into the applications business up, up the stack and sell enterprise software. The browser doesn't really matter. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they were cooked. But so I think that, you know, maybe the there is some merit to their actions, but it wouldn't change anything. So I think you've got to be very careful. The government is going to be very careful about thwarting, you know, claiming that there's, you know, illegal activity 
when it's just like the potential for illegal activity. And because at the end of the day, I think it does hurt U.S. competitiveness. And that's what I, I don't like this public private relationship, this constant tension. I wish there was be much better alignment and the government was more supportive. I, we agree. Let's move on to the next story. That's going to be a transition to my next uh, segment. Um, uh, I want opinions. I want to get your thoughts on. And th this story is going to segue. So don't jump ahead. Exclusive. This is in Reuters. Qualcomm explores acquiring pieces of Intel's chip design business. Qualcomm is interested in exploring pieces of the design business. One of them is the Intel PC business, sources say, as well as other various units. So you get the mobile chip maker Qualcomm looking to buy the Intel's PC business. Um, as part of, you know, Qualcomm's been doing great with mobile devices. So that's a segue into the next segment. Dave, is the personal computer dead? God, no. no Long personal time. computer. Personal, <laughs> and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Personal <laughs> computer is going to go through a, a, a radical transformation. Personal computing is going to get supercharged by AI and AR and VR that's going to be embedded. And to your earlier point, custom silicon is going to have a renaissance. And the personal computing business is going to uh, uh, thrive, in my opinion. And I think it's going to be a, a boon for companies like Dell and even Lenovo and HP um, who, you know, have 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 withstood the market uh, decline over the years. And now there's essentially an oligopoly. There's basically only three PC manufacturers. So I think this actually really does favor Dell. I mean, their, their PC business yeah. didn't do great last quarter, but I think it's just a matter of time. You saw it during the pandemic, having a big footprint in PCs is a cash flow, you know, cow for a company with anemic margins, you know, like Adele, when that, when that business starts taking off again, it throws off tons of cash and they're very comfortable being a low margin business and competing, you know, based with their supply chain and their distribution channel. So I think it's just a matter of time before, you know, they see a big uptick in their PC business and I others. Have, my headline on this story I'm putting together is the personal computer is dead, period. Long live the personal computer. Yeah, welcome there you the, go. Welcome to the AI driven future. I love it. I, I, I think the PC personal computer is a generic term. Steve Jobs always compared to like bicycle for your mind. It always it always was personal. I think we are getting more personal with computing than ever before. I think personal computing with AI, AI PCs, is going to absolutely be a major growth area. But it's not going to look like the yesterday PC. Yeah, we'll have laptops, we'll have devices, and the Qualcomm thing's interesting because you got ARM designs, you got Qualcomm and chip people making these things both smaller, faster, cheaper. But in this in this shift that's happening with generative AI. The personalization is critical. So personal productivity is the number one thing we talk about on the cube. Number one, when they, people say the benefits of AI, it's personal productivity. It's productivity. So you have personal computers that people run for their for their personal life, as well as they what they use at the office. So I think the the PC of the future is a personal computing device. Devices plural, for personal productivity and enterprise scale because that's the two areas that are hot right now. I think agents are coming, agentic systems. We wrote a post on SiliconANGLE. You guys wrote that groundbreaking research story on The Economist, you and George Gilbert, that was phenomenal. Personal productivity is the personal computing generic category value proposition. Meaning even back in the day when I was in college, the first personal computer, it was personal and it was productive. Spreadsheets were, just starting, you have to do it manually. So, you know, I think the role of silicon diversity and custom silicon and all the evolution is going to change and reimagine the entire products that get built, the strategies and how to market them and sell them, how they're integrated, the partnerships around them. Everything's changing. And again, Dell, HPE, Lenovo, you name it, they're all going to win. If they get this right, if they don't, they lose everything. This is a this is an extinction moment, in my opinion, for some companies. If if they are not doing AI PCs with custom silicon, it could be worse than a Y two K disruption problem. It's an extinction event for them. You have to get the custom silicon. 
and you got to have it on multiple devices. My user doesn't think about their PC. I think about my phone, what's in my car, what's on my laptop. Apple got it right. They made their own chips. They have iMessage. Things are tight. You know, I mean, that, that's going to be the integrated connected user experience. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, I, I advise and all the companies out there, HP, Dell, you name it. If you're not doing custom silicon, you're dead. If you do well, it, well, you're in. And I think the other thing I was saying, oligopoly, but the, the the market is actually, you know, more dynamic than I implied because obviously Apple, I agree, is setting the trend here um, with custom silicon. And they're obviously as well, you know, better at experience than, than others. And Microsoft, you know, with the tablets is, um, is a major force in the marketplace. And so you, the customers yeah. are going to have optionality. And I think to your point, the expectations of the user are going to change dramatically with a, with AI and that experience that integrated, that seamless, that connected, that vibrant experience is going to be, uh, cr create a tremendous dislocations in how we think about the PC. I love your headline. The PC is dead. Long live the PC. Uh, it is, it, it's going to change quite dramatically over the next, you know, several years. So a couple of areas I want to look at here. One is the partnerships in the software ecosystem. The old days was Intel processor and Windows, and then people who were independent software developers, ISVs. Then you got supply chain issues. You got to be resilient. There's geopolitical risks. And then what is the differentiator? What makes a PC an AI PC? And then how do you compete for share? Who? How do you win? And this, these are the killer questions, right? So, you know, to me, I think the different, how would an AI PC, Dave, is completely rethinking the device. I think the future devices are going to be judged by the by how well they run AI workloads, period. If you're not running AI workloads on a personal device, computer, handheld, IoT device, you're not going to be successful. They all need data. So they will be judged by their processing power and how they support the workloads because the user experiences have to depend on those two things. Of course, the user experience is number one. But the, those other two factors require a complete redesign, Dave, moving away from the traditional architecture um, that we saw to AI-optimized systems with GPUs, accelerators, data movement, and devices. And devices, by the way, are going to be big devices and small devices. So I think we're moving back to the client server era in a whole nother way. The big monster GPUs, machines that NVIDIA is selling, HP, Dell, they're all selling HPE, I should say, not HP. They're selling servers. Those servers pack a lot of punch. The devices are smaller form factors. Some cases, they just run on batteries. They all got to work together in a distributed way. So you're going to start to see interplay. This requires a complete overhaul of system architecture. This is something that nobody's talking about. And if you're HP, the, the PC maker, I just don't see them talking about it, right? Dell is talking about it. Lenovo is talking with VMware. We, we just came up from VMworld, VMware Explorer, I should say, um, and others, the super micros on it. So, so and of course, the cloud is going to power it all too. They're one big power center. So I think you're going to see these big back office machines. Don't, I don't, you, do you dare call it a mainframe, Dave? <laughs> with the servers. <laughs> connected to these well, client devices. We are living a complete full circle to a completely integrated old school environment. Remember the old mainframes were separate from the clients, mini computers and the mini computers were separate from the PCs connected to LANs. Now they're all integrated. They're all working together because um, you got to move the data around. So I mean, that, that's what it looks like. And it's going to be like a, a pin device, voice activated, but it's not a thing. A PC is devices, plural. And I think that's where the edge is going to be. And you know what runs that, Dave? Software. Well, and I think it's familiar that, for like NVIDIA. Yeah, totally. And, and at that client level, I think ARM is going to become the dominant platform. Um, I'm just looking at some data from the Cube research here. I mean, you go through 2023, it's just, a, you know, x86, of course, dominates. Now you had some signs. You had the first true inference uh, phone with um, the iPhone X, where we had facial recognition with neural processing units, they really haven't trickled into the PC yet, but they will NPUs. Uh, and then Apple shipped the first NPUs, um, which was the you know first rudimentary example of AI PCs around 2020. 
And then all of a sudden you started to see the arm based PCs, uh, grow. And I think by within the 24 months, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's more 24 to 36 months, but, but within the two to three year time frame, arm based PC architectures are going to cross over and take over from x86. So x86 really peaked, uh, PCs actually peaked probably in 2012. Um, and then, you know, came at back up, bounced back up during COVID, but then arm is, is going to take over with, with AI PCs. And you're seeing that with Apple, uh, with its custom Silicon, I think Qualcomm is obviously going to be a big force here. It's going to be interesting to see if Microsoft chooses to do its own custom Silicon, um, and use it is just using Qualcomm as a bridge. We'll see, you know, we'll see if other PC manufacturers like a Dell or a Lenovo choose to do their own custom silicon lenovo probably go with huawei to your point lenovo getting very aggressive in u.s markets we saw that at vmware explore uh, it's just going to be a really interesting pcs were kind of boring for the longest time until covid when nobody could get them and then it died down but now we're going to see a renaissance yeah i i think a renaissance is coming it's 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 a systems revolution but the, the game is still the same for personal computing the personal computing error because it's devices. You got to get the small form factors with to pack, pack a lot of punch and power and saw and performance. You got to process the data, but if it's too small, then the server will do it, right? The server's the 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 main system serves the edge node. So this is this has to be written in software, Dave. The software layer has to be written. That's why I think um, the Cube Research has really nailed the future Gen AI stack is because. All the work of the infrastructure side around clustered systems and how hardware is being uh, made, made these days around how chips are working together. You got GPUs, CPUs, XPUs in uh, high bandwidth memory, Ethernet in the fabric of the board. This These advances are going to create these new systems. So that's why the data center is hot right now. The data layer you guys put together at the Cube Research, you guys identified all the key areas, open table formats, a changing governance compliance landscape, and then intelligent applications uh, systems. And then the top of the stack, there's two types of apps. You've got scalable applications, problems that are solved for the first time in history that couldn't have been done before, other than some specialty millions of dollars of soft of hardware. Those are like solving biology, chemistry problems that have never been solved before cracking encryption. That's going to be scalable applications. And the, the research and stories you guys just published on agentic systems, Agentic systems will be a feature of all applications in the future, period. I totally am convinced, no doubt yep. in my mind. Agents are the future because it's inherently a software model based grounded in scalable data. This is where you're seeing the productivity gains. That's where you're seeing the, the enterprise scale. So outside of personal productivity, the enterprise scale is pretty clear. I got private information, security, governance and personal productivity. So doing those two things together is going to be seamless. That is still hard computer science. The software needs to be written. So it's very clear this next generation application categories, scalable applications and agentic systems embedded in software. That's it. There's, there's nothing else. Nothing else is SaaS evolves, right? SaaS is um, an old category. And remember, SaaS was born out of the mobile era. Mobile era was born out of the web era. So you had web applications, mobile applications, SaaS applications, and now here we are. A new set of applications are coming. Scalable apps and agentic apps. Um, and then the rest is just kind of one, you know, one or the other. So this is going to set the table for companies like Dell, HP, HPE, Lenovo, VMware. If they get this right, they don't screw that up. They're kind of on track to be the plumbing. Um, Broadcom certainly wins with the chips. Qualcomm wins. So there will be demand. I do not see a recession in the chip business. I think that the Magnificent Seven stocks will continue to thunder away. Uh, I'm I'm bullish on on the tech market and those stocks there. Well, semis have been getting hammered this week, which yeah. you know, I mean, I I I, I'm, I think it's a buying opportunity. I don't know when. People, I don't know people when the time informed are but... scared. I was at the top of the market. What they're looking at is failing startups. Well, I think okay. it's technical. I think that it's yeah. technical. And of course you've got the the whole jobs thing and the fed and everything else, but I just think, yeah, you know, the market is kind of toppy, but it's, I think it's great here. Let some air out of it. You know, Broadcom, I thought had a really good quarter and then the stock has been getting crushed. Um, 
I think which no one is can, no one can connect the dots, but I mean, they're going to the demand and the shift that's going to the new market that this new AI application market we just talked about up and down the stack is being completely redone. That means everyone's doing a hardware refresh on the a device side. Apple's even gonna now, got a thing coming up for the next iPhone. So you got hardware refresh. I mean, if you're Dell and HP on the PC side, it's a refresh cycle coming. So number one, that's easy money. Then the the next devices that come out of it, not just the laptops and the desktops and the devices, there's going to be more devices connected to the internet. So that and the demand for Gen AI workloads is going to be off the charts because that's what the developers are writing and that's what the entrepreneurs are working on. Where the action is stalled is the overfunded hype market. Okay, and I think this this is my last my last segment I want to bring up. Well, at least the ones I was wanted to talk about with you is that you know this uh, idea of king making. You know, in the in Silicon Valley, the venture capitalists have been investing in everything that moves. If you look at the top stories that Rob Hof has on the docket this week on Silicon Angle, it's still the same message, Dave. You know, everyone another big funding round. You know, I mean, you can't you can't you know move an inch without seeing another billion dollar valuation for a pre product company. Um, so I think the hype cycle is going to probably bust out some of those. You know, go big or go home, and and that's the question. You know, this whole idea of of uh, king making, build it, they will come. Remember the internet days? Is that a viable funding strategy? Or do you think it's going to go bust? Do you think king making, which is a term used in Silicon Valley for saying, okay, let's give these guys, a, imagine us getting a billion dollars in working capital for the queue. What would we do with it? Certainly that would scare other people from maybe entering the market, right? Maybe. Well, is that, does that tactic work? First, you piss a lot of it away because that's what always happens when you overfund yeah, no, but, something. But would people but, be scared to go after a category that has like the big VCs like Andreessen and Horowitz, the ones who throw the big money around, say, wow, I, they just got funded by a tier one I think, VC. I, I think if there's 400 million in working capital and there's I think, four guys in a garage. I think if they're smart, they would say, okay, they see a TAM. Um, and they're just sprinkling their bets around. And if, and if, if you're smart engineers, I would go look at that, the problem they're trying to solve and see if I can come up with a more novel way of solving it. Because I would think just, you know, capital is just one ingredient of the, that determines success. So I, I would say a lot of times VCs just throw money at stuff. You know, you know, how, you know, the model better than I do. It's like, Hey, we 90% of them going to fail, but we'll get that 10 Ten percent will be a thousand bagger, and we'll make a ton of dough. And the rest, well, so, well, we, we, we didn't, we didn't have a good batting average, sounds, but we made a like, ton of money. Sounds like we work, right? You know, SoftBank and we work. Hey, give, hey, give a boatload of money and hope it work. Hope they dominate. Um, but to your point, throwing money at the problem doesn't guarantee success, especially in an agile market like this. Because you mentioned it, over hiring, overspending, um, setting expectations too high. If the market shifts, they're flat-footed. So I think it's, I, I don't think it's a viable strategy. I think it's carnage actually. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would think this, you know, look at, I mean, as far as deploying capital, you, you, to me, as a, as a, from a founder perspective um, and, and an entrepreneur perspective, you want to be really selective. You want to be um, a, a targeted, you know, you just don't want to spray and pray, but that's the the VC playbook. And obviously it has worked. It made a lot of money, but um, it's never, it's never, to me, it's not, it's not a very founder friendly posture, although a lot of founders buy into it. It's just, you know, we've talked about this before, the, the, the failure rate, um, and I'll define failure as fail to return one um, X to the, the investors the failure rate is defined as I just defined it of series A, B and C companies is the same. You would think it would be lower the deeper you get into the rounds, but A, B is easily 70% failure rate um, as I find it. And so we're not very good at allocating capital. I mean, you know, we talk about uh, capital allocators and these big time VCs. I mean, their batting average is horrendous, but it doesn't matter because they get one that pays off big time. I mean, I saw it with IDG Ventures, you know, Pat McGovern sprinkled his money around and he, he, he hit Netscape and then he invested in China. He hit Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu, and spring. you know, and yeah. Spring, and and, and, and the, the other hundred investments that failed didn't matter. Yeah. 
pray and spray, right? Yep. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this brings up a good point. You know, when you're talking about the um, AIPC, you and I were talking about this this week um, you know, amongst ourselves. Remember during the 90s when Intel was changing processors so fast? Yeah, the 286, 386, 486, Pentium. Seeing the the cycles of innovation, both on the hardware side and then even on the model side. Context windows are doubling. The cost to run these models are getting lower. Training still is high, so there's still money there. How do you make this? Do you see a comparison between, I mean, I see a comparison between those chip cycles and just generative AI in general right now. And then and if you're a leader, how do you keep up with that? That's a question. And then if you're like a Dell or a PC manufacturer like HP or say NVIDIA building super servers uh, or Amazon trying to make their cloud the best, what do you, what do you, how do you make, how do you make of that? Do you see a similarity between the two? So I, I'd answer that in a couple of ways. So first of all, the, 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 the price performance of the performance of Silicon is accelerating at a quite a dramatic pace. So if you just do the math, everybody's familiar with Moore's law. Moore's law, if you do the math, you know, doubling every, let's say 18 to 24 months, that's about a 40% improvement in performance per year. So you're talking about 286, 386, 46 Pentium. We were on a on a curve about 40% improvement for, uh, per year. Floyer and I went back and looked, this is like 2019 or so, and started looking at Apple's A series in, in the iPhone. And if you look at the combinatorial effects of the CPU, these, by the way, this is ARM-based monolithic chips, big SRAM, big shared SRAM. I kind of like big chips. We can talk about chiplets someday, but if you look at the combinatorial effects of the, from a performance standpoint of the CPU, the GPU, the neural processing unit, all the interconnectivity there, any accelerators associated with that, the A series, and I think this was, uh, we, we looked at probably the A15, it was on a pace of 110% annually when you when you look back to the original A series. So that's you know almost 3x Moore's law. And then if you look at where Nvidia is, Nvidia got a thousand X improvement in eight years, whereas whereas the X86 was a hundred X in 10 years. So you're seeing an order of magnitude better performance in less time. So we're seeing an acceleration of the performance curve. Now, the flip side of that is I think it's somewhat of a myth to say we've never seen, you know, such fast uh, changes and adoption rates with technology. I don't think that's true. I think if you look at, you know, things like television and radio and 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 other, you know, modes of trend, new modes of transportation, um, the adoption actually takes some time. I think we're astounded by the rate of adoption of chat gpt um but 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 overall i think adoption takes time because you have people and processes involved and i think we're seeing that with ai right now people are you know using chat gpt they're using other llms there's there's massive investments going in but people are still trying to figure out what to do with it so you have on the one hand you have this massive processing power on the other hand you have the people in process you know being able to absorb it and I think as we've talked about before, you've got the old, which is declining. You look at HPE's uh, results, they were actually at a very good quarter thanks to, to PC, of take, thanks to servers. Uh, but their, their hybrid cloud business was down in double digits. Their edge business was down. So you have a lot of the old legacy stuff declining and the new stuff is, is not quite yet big enough to propel you know, these companies into new heights, even though <laughs> Dell and HP, both HPE, both had pretty amazing, you know, server orders. But my point is that it takes time for adoption to occur. And so that's kind of my take, John, you've got the performance uh, coming out of the factory on one side, and you've got the, the, the market's ability to absorb it on the other side. And eventually those two things, you know, come into balance and the market figures out how to apply all that new tech. And that's when you get the steep part of the S curve. And I think we're probably, I don't know, maybe 18 months away from that, maybe a little less, maybe a year away from that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's going to be the, the biggest challenge that um, the leaders have to deal with because that PC revolution was a tell sign of how to manage fast cycles. And you're seeing that with allocation these days, people are allocating products, you either get the GPUs or you don't. 
So I think I think it's going to be very interesting to watch. That's why I think the king making is not a good strategy in this market because it's very dynamic. The, the sands can shift literally overnight. Um, but again, the capital markets are a different animal than the entrepreneurs who actually build companies. I just think it's bad to take too much cash. I think you always get the right amount of cash. Um, if you have to take cash to have a barrier to entry and your whole strategy is to thwart new entrants because you have more money than they do, I don't buy that, never have. Um, it would be great to have a boatload of cash, but then also you're restricted on your exit. I mean, so um, it's it's a double-edged sword. Um, what else is going on, Dave? We got events coming up. We got uh, a little reprieve here. Um, so I'm going to Oracle Open, um, well, Open uh, Oracle Cloud World, I guess they call it now. VMware VMworld is now VMware Explore. Oracle yeah. Open World is now Oracle Cloud World. So we're going to be locked in. Um, that for a while, no pun intended. Rob Streche and I are going out, I'm, I'm and then we got CrowdStrike the week after that. I I do. I think you're at Mandiant that week, so that's going to be really interesting to see, you know how how the the whole CrowdStrike debacle plays out at their conference. Um, you've seen in the press, you know the the back and forth between Delta and Microsoft and CrowdStrike. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. I, I mean, Oracle, you you know Oracle, Oracle Open World. We used to. You know, we've been going there Oracle, for years. Oracle closed world. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty closed. I mean, it's it's going to be insular, but they I, let, I they but, don't let media in there anymore, do they? Video. Well, they let analysts in, but I mean, I, I I will tell you, I mean, Oracle has a phenomenal business, right? I mean, they what they did post Sun acquisition and the vertical integration they did. You talked about mainframes. They have built just an awesome, you know, mainframe class business. You know their their main their mainframe business is I would argue better than IBM's mainframe business, <clears throat> and IBM created the mainframe business. So you know Oracle with Exadata with its application portfolio, what it's doing. I mean Oracle's, you know I've said it a million times. Larry Ellison and that team they invest in tech. They may not always you know they're not they're not first, but they're fast followers. <clears throat> Eventually they figure it out. You know they screwed up cloud, but then they they got it right and they. They pick their they pick their battles, and they're really good at the hard hard stuff. And so, so that's what we're going to hear. And of course, Oracle poo poos all the shiny new toys. It reminds me of Hawk Tan a couple of weeks ago at at VMware. They don't they don't they don't necessarily chase the shiny new toys. They just let the market sort of play out, and then you know they build it into their system and and integrate it. And they just keep throwing more value into the system, keeping prices high, making it you know, really unattractive for people to, to pull the plug and migrate. So that's going to be interesting. I think the fun part about Oracle open world or cloud world is there a lot of, a lot of fun analysts there. Sanjeev Mohan will be there. Um, like I said, Rob Stretchy will be there. Uh, 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 I don't know if Sarbjeet's going, I'm not sure if he's going to be there. Tony bear, all the crusty database guys, all the ex Gartner database guys will be there. Merv will be there and they're fun. You know, they're, they're, they're all mainframers. They've been around the industry for a long, long time. They've seen it all. They're skeptics. They're, you know, they're kind of, you know, negative on every shiny new toy. And it's good to see you. They ask good questions and they're just fun to hang out with. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah. And we have uh Salesforce coming up. So Salesforce Dreamforce. That's on the on the docket. That's coming up big time. Uh, NetApp Insight. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna be playing in the SAS Pro Am golf tournament, Dave. You go. You doing that again? Where's that? Yeah, just got that's down in North Carolina. North Carolina. Um, yeah, SAS is rumored to go public. Um, they turned down an acquisition. We covered that on Silicon Angle. Um, great company. Love that company. I've been around for a while. So just a lot of events. The the thing that I want to talk to you about though, Dave, is we didn't get to it because I wanted to save it for the end is um i kind of mentioned it um george gilbert and you've been working on this digital twin story okay with us and the whole team but you guys mainly drove it um and economists just ran that content in the economists um about digital twins this is a huge groundbreaking research area you guys have got so congratulations that economists featuring it. it's a real compliment to the cube research team yeah, that sure. that kind of quality organization is featuring such groundbreaking research. And by the way, nobody has this research. You guys crushed it. Um, if you're listening, check out thecuberesearch.com. 
you'll never you you'll never feel smarter after reading those articles and all always on the cutting edge. You guys hit a home run with this. Yes, it's not just digital twins for factories anymore. They they identified the future. It's in their leadership section. Take us through the digital twins. The headline is digital twins are fast becoming part of our everyday life. Welcome to the mirror world. Um, yeah, so that's that, the that headline. That, but give us give so, us the so, background of this. So what's the so that was story? a complimentary article to the one that that George co-authored, and it comes from the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years with this whole notion of Uber for all. In other words, the idea that things that databases understand, you know, strings, if you will, and ones and zeros, ultimately are going to you know they're they're moving to a world where. Uh, where, where people, places, and things are the representation of, of the business in real time. And today, if you think about it, today's analytic systems are, they're asynchronous systems. They're disconnected. They take exhaust from the, the transaction and the operational systems, and they shove it into a, a database or a data warehouse or a lake house, and, and then it becomes a historical system of truth. And, and it's you know, powerful. You do analytics on it, but you can't do what Uber does, which is in real time. Um, create an outcome uh, so if you think about it you've got you know a, a a rider initiates a transaction there's a driver there's a there's an eta there's a destination there's pricing there's these are all different data elements that uber did the hard work to harmonize and make them all the same and so businesses increasingly to use your term a digital twin uh, want to build a digital representation of their business that in real time they can look at the state of the business. They can then use agents to sort of make a better plan or even predict the next best action. Uh, but there's missing pieces here. So what we did is we took a deep dive. We've been taking deep dives into the modern data stack, which is getting a little long in the tooth, frankly. And it's in, in some of the missing pieces to create this, you know, real time, you know, systems of agency and, one of the missing pieces is that is a, is a harmonization har, a harmonization layer. Some people call it the semantic layer that Uber actually built, built so that all these different disparate data elements could be, you know, merged together in real time. And the example in business that we often use is somebody says revenue in a meeting. Is it is it revenue? Is it bookings? Is it ARR? What is it? You know, is it MRR? Mm -hmm. So revenue needs to mean revenue, and you can't do that today because you got data in Salesforce. It's different from data in your ERP system. It's different from you know your Oracle database. It's different than your Workday. So, so, so there's got to be a layer to harmonize all that, and that's going to be a really important piece. And then the other one is the the agents being able to apply multiple agents on top of the RAG system. So you're you're seeing AI and RAG emerge is another layer here, but you know, it's not that good, frankly. And so agents, you know, multiple agents that have authority that will act on behalf of humans and can be orchestrated together, um, to meet a business objective. So you've got top-down business goals, which might be gain market share or, or improve customer satisfaction. And you've got a sort of tree of, of actions and steps that have to take place top down to make that happen, that the agents understand. And then bottom up, you have data that you're pulling from and writing to these legacy systems that is then harmonized and then multiple agents can work on them. A lot of people talking about single agents like co-pilots. Not a lot of people are talking about these, these swarms of agents working together. And we think that is something that is going to define the next era of intelligent data apps. And you can go to the, the cuberesearch.com, check out podcasts. That's probably the best place to do it. Look at breaking analysis and look at, but there's probably now we've done 10 pieces on the, these related topics. And, um, and I think, I think we're getting some recognition as you pointed out the economist, and then there's longer form, uh, of articles that are coming out, uh, in the economist. I think one of the things that's key about that story is, is that you guys nailed not just the narrow definition of digital twins, like in the geek world of, that we live in, uh, nerd nation of it's factories, simulating factories. Yes, it's used for that mainly because that's a great application. But what the economist pointed out with your article and then your deeper research is it's all processes. It's and with now with generative AI, digital twins is now viable across the entire organization. That's why I'm so adamant that agentic systems will be one of the 
two categories that will drive this next uh, wave of innovation next 20 years. SaaS was cloud. Now the Gen AI generation, it's all about personalization, agentic systems, personal productivity, and enterprise scale. So, you know, and then solving hard problems. Entrepreneurs still solve hard problems. Um, businesses got to solve these hard problems that they could never do before. Digital twins are coming to everywhere. And even in our world, events, you're going to see digital twins come to events. I think this is huge. I think this is an area that if you're listening and you want to capture the future and you're in any department in a company or you're an entrepreneur building something, this is going to change the landscape of every single company, every single department of a business, every single value activity in the value chain, whether that's the user experience with the results of say personalization or generative experiences that's coming. Those AI workloads, we talked about that before in the, earlier in the pod here. And, but if, if there's going to be changes, radical changes with the system, events, digital, the digitization of the, of the world is happening. That's why I'm bullish on Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to be the gold of digital. I believe that to be true. I think that uh, the, the purists are right on that. Um, you know, uh, Taylor, uh, Sailor, I should say, is right on that one. Michael um, Saylor, yeah. Michael Saylor. And I think that's going to be a big deal. I, and I just, I just want to shout out to George Gilbert, who's done a ton of work in this area. He's, he goes deep. He's a real techie. He connects dots. He does real research, um, and has really collaborated, been a great collaborator, um, to, to work this narrative and, and really try to see the future. So yeah. it's been awesome. It's just getting started. I'm doing a post on this right now. I did a, uh, by the way, I wrote a, a, a Substack uh, article on um, the agentic systems and combining the digital twin to a post. I also put on my LinkedIn newsletter. I should send it to Bravo at Silicon Angle. I'm doing a post, two posts right now. One on is the AI PC dead, long live the AI PC, or is the PC dead, long live the PC? And the other one is how digital twins affects marketing and events specifically. Um, the days of lead gen, email marketing, inbound marketing, you know, landing pages, web-based marketing will be soon a, a thing of the past. In comes data and digital twins because you can do things with digital twins with data, like look at what content works better. Remember, manufacturing use simulation to make the factory better and more productive and zero defects. With digital twins for say marketing, you can look at the data, like events, it's physical factory for content. You could look at what's worked and then bring it to digital and make the content better, both for the physical event, but also for the users that are online. So, you know, that's just one small example, customer support. You name the vertical, you name the department, it's happening. This is huge. And I think, you know, the companies we cover, like Kong on the API side, APIs are 85% of um, the world, the cloud native world, we're with the KubeCon. Those engineers, those platform engineers are now going to move into data engineering. That's merging. The entire market is going this way. So you guys nailed it. I think it's a groundbreaking post. I thought it was the best work I've seen in a generation of research analyst period. Um, it has a lot of meat in the bone. So we're going to be watching. This Thank you, John. You're going to hear a lot about this uh, from us. And certainly I'll be talking a lot about it. So congratulations. Now, yep. on, on a self-serving note, is we just launched today our awards program for the Cube and Silicon Angle. We're going to take submissions for companies who are innovative, and we're going to have judges. We will judge companies in multiple categories. So that's going to be fun, Dave. Yeah, I'm excited about this. Um, Cube.net slash awards. Check it out. The Cube.net slash awards. Tons of categories. Listen to the categories. Hy Hypercubed. C U. B E D, you've been cubed. Hypercube Innovation Award, Rocket Ship Award, the best rocket ship company, AI Innovator of the Year, Innovative Responsible AI, Top AI Implementations Internally, Most Innovative User Conference, People Categories, Product Categories, a ton of areas. We're going to get tons of submissions already. Um, they're flying in right now. I already got sort of a bunch coming in. And hasn't hasn't even been um, officially launched with the with the form yet. Just a lot of people contacting in. So check out the 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 Cube Awards. If you bit if you win, you will have been cubed. 
Dave. That's the award we're, slogan we're going with. Yeah, so, so the cube.net <laughs> slash awards. Um, you know, this is going to be fun, John. We're doing this to really highlight uh, some of the innovation and 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 share that with our community and with our audience. And uh, very low entry fee. You know, we're not trying to make a ton of money on this. Um, we're just going to, we're just covering our cost. The cube research and the broader uh, collective community are going to be the judges. And like John said, there's tons of categories. So, so check that out <clears throat> and, and enter small, medium, and large open. We're just looking for innovation. Yeah. So all good stuff. Um, anything you want to talk about, Dave, that you want to, before we kind of wrap things up? Um, well, I, I mean, I, we, we really haven't talked about our NYSE. I don't know if you wanted to, to touch on that. I mean, we touched on it a little bit and yeah, I'll be there. I'll be the last week of September and we're continuing to build out. We got one working studio there. We're going to build out the button room. We're going to have a set down there, uh, our own set as well. So two sets, second largest deployment on the NYSE first digital TV podcast style on the floor and uh, should be great. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to I'll be down there as well, you know, quite a bit. And um, you know, people are really intrigued as to what we're going to do there. Basically, we have our studio in Palo Alto, we have one outside of Boston and Marlboro, a smaller studio. We as you may know, we use our Palo Alto studio extensively. We've done seven super clouds out of our Palo Alto studio, which is a live hybrid event. We take pre-records for people who can't come into the studio live. We work them into the run of show, but we have we have innovators from Silicon Valley coming into the studio all day long. There's there's networking going on. I mean, it was awesome that, that SuperCloud Seven. We had Benoit Dajaville, we had uh, uh, Moham RF. They got together. They started talking. My understanding is they're they're like meeting weekly now as a result of that that meetup. Um, we it's just a, a an amazing you know, buzzsaw of innovation that comes into Palo Alto. We're going to replicate that, you know, your digital twin example, we're going to replicate that now at the NYSE. Um, the Marlboro is not really set up for that, but NYSE is like a perfect venue for that type of um, ongoing activity. New York is, you know, such a hotbed of activity right now and always has been. So yeah. I'm super excited about that, John, that, that, that initiative you've led. Yeah, a lot more going on. So, so, so a lot more media stuff happening. Silicon Angle, the Cube.net, um, the Cube 365, the Cube Research, the CubeAI.com. Check out the Cube AI. It's our first generation neural network. All the content from the Cube interviews are vector embeds. Type in, type in things like H, what's happened at HPE Discover 2024. You'll see what happened. Um, you want to find out what's happening events. Great summary uh, of what's happened. And then um, more prompts. We're adding stuff to it every day. It's going to become probably our main interface for personalizing the corpus of cube content. So check it out. Of course, go to siliconangle.com for all the stories. That's where the content's free. Our mission is to continue to put out free content, share stuff here in the pod when we can, connect the dots, um, bring high-frequency insights with the cube research. Dave, great, uh, great, great to see you. And I'll see you on the road probably in a couple of weeks. Yeah, when am I going to see you next? Uh, um, <laughs> we got a lot of you events. coming back here. When are you going to be in New York? I I'm going to be in New York the last week of September. I'll pop up to Boston, see my son, Tyler. He just moved to the North end. He's got a job at, at scale doing some programming, just graduated Northeastern. He's got a good job over there. Chris Nation's company. So shout out to at scale. Oh, I was just on the phone with Chris, um, yesterday. Um, uh, if I may, if I just may take a second, yeah. Yeah, um, please, every year, uh, Chris Lynch, really spearheads is his, is his energy that creates this tech tackles cancer and TTC is essentially live. They call it live karaoke. It's actually live bands. Um, and it is kind of karaoke cause they can, you know, cheat and look at the words, but it's fantastic. It's done in Cambridge, Massachusetts every year. Uh, it's for, um, raising money for kids with cancer. And, you know, Chris gets up, he sings, he takes off his shirt. He's a madman every year, shows off his, uh, his awesome body because he's always in good shape. Uh, but it's, it brings together, you know, over the years, some, some local, um, you know, Boston area uh, bands and, and in the tech community, you know, people like George Hope, people from Pure Storage, uh, people from Infinidad over the years. Steve Duplessis got up a couple of years ago and sang Mustang Sally. I was really impressed with, you know, Dupe's ability to, to bang it out. Uh, and it's great. So we are going to cover it. I'm actually away that week, but uh, we're sending in a crew 
uh, Chris and I, Chris will come into the studio. We'll do a little preview. Um, we'll have a little, you know, little shit talk on the competition and, uh, and he's awesome. And, and we're a big supporter of, uh, of that. The cube has, has supported this now for the last several years. So just a shout out for that. It's on November 7th in Cambridge. We'll be sharing details on that. All right, cool. Great shout out. Dave, great to see you. Episode 72 in the books. I'm Sean for Dave Alon. Take track in the seat with the noise as usual. Check out our sites. As we mentioned, see you next time.